Okay, let's, um, we're going to wrap up this uh, thing on relativism here for just a, a brief second. But it's all part of what happens when we lose the meta narrative. And we were talking about how the burden of proof really should be on the relativist. I've always been fascinated by the, the notion of communication. And you think about how this works. I have a thought in my brain. And I want to communicate that thought to you. Well, we could do the mind meld, you know, but that doesn't work too well. Or we could do it this way. I could take that thought in my mind and I could convert it to electrical pulses that go down to my diaphragm that force air out of my lungs and pass these little uh, flappy muscle things and contract those muscle things in such a way and, and move my mouth and my tongue and my lips in such a way that I cause the air to beat in a certain way and those airwaves go through the air and they go into your ear and then they cause this little a window to vibrate or hammer and that moves and so forth and it pounds on a window and that causes fluid to move and that causes a little cilia to wiggle and that creates little electrical signals and that goes to your brain and you know exactly what I'm saying when I say it. That is awesome. Isn't it amazing how random forces have brought that about? The reality of the world that we live in the absoluteness of it, the order of it, the exquisiteness of the world around us is the compelling reason that we should draw on and point to. Well, <coughs> there's a third consequence to losing the meta narrative, and it is dependency. Because when the enemy goes against the nature of God, remember that God is the one who equips, he empowers. God is the one who distributes his own power that the smallest creature might flourish. He gives them the ability, the responsibility the authority and the power that the smallest creature might shalom. The enemy does the opposite. The enemy consolidates power, enslaving the masses, making them dependent, destroying their incentive to shalom destroying their fruitfulness. That is happening all around us. And by the way, that is what happens when we float in the world. And that is what happens in, in your life and my life. Because why? We have a tendency to consolidate power. That's what's happening in the church, by the way. It's not because there is some conspiracy going on. It's because that's the way the world flows. It will always flow that way. You have to guard against that in your family. We have a, we have a whole plague of adult children in our culture today. Because they become dependent we're raising a whole nation of dependence. We care more about the elk in Yellowstone because we've got a sign that says, please don't feed the elk. You know why we have that sign? Because we don't want them to become dependent. Because we know we'll destroy them in the end. It creates a loss of incentive, a loss of desire, loss of purpose, loss of meaning, become barren. Okay, so, here we go. With the loss of the meta narrative, what happens is 
My heart becomes the source of truth. And when my heart becomes the source of truth, then a lot of things begin to go haywire. There was a, a movie a number of years ago. My students were really into this thing. I hope you didn't see it. I didn't. I, I couldn't go to a movie like this. <coughs> but it was uh, Scarface. And my students got really uh, high on this particular quote from Scarface. And this is what, it, this is, was the quote. He says, you're not good. You just know how to hide, how to lie. Me, I don't have that problem. Me, I always tell the truth even when I lie. And here is one of the commentators, Bracton's uh, comment on this. It says, by his paradoxical statement, Tony Montana, that was the guy in the movie, means he is living authentically, while those that judge him are phonies. So I began to hear this uh, in my students uh, six, seven years ago, maybe more now. I began to hear these things from my students. Like, I want to be authentic. That's a good thing, by the way. I, I love this in our, in, our, in our current new generation. They want to be authentic. They hate hypocrisy. We should hate hypocrisy. But here's how this gets morphed really, really quickly. I want to be authentic. I want to be real. I want to follow my heart. In my heart, I know this is right, or my heart tells me this, or my heart tells me that, or I don't have peace about this in my heart. And I was trying to talk to my students about, you know, what it is they're saying here, and, and quite frankly, how, how we morph from the idea of wanting to be real to, to spiritual all about me. It kind of came to a head one time because I told you this program that I, I teach in is just an adjunct now, but is in a total immersion program. So if a student doesn't show up, that's, that's a big deal. So this girl didn't show up one time for class. And so we followed up and say, hey, are you okay? And she said, yeah, I, I, just, I got up this morning and, and my heart told me that I needed to do taekwondo. So I said, okay, that, that's it. That's it. I, because I didn't have a real good answer for these students. Because quite frankly, you know as well as I do, if somebody says, well, my heart just tells me, that's like the trump card, right? I mean, what, what do you say to that? Well, you know, my heart tells me, well, you, you're not allowed to say, baby, your heart may be really wrong, you know? <laughs> Especially in a culture that we live in now. There's nothing really to say to that. So... Yeah, for those of you who might understand the way the Lord has wired me weirdly, when I get onto these things, it has been my practice, and back before we had a lot of technology to help us, I would buy a new Bible, I would get a highlighter, I would start with Genesis 1, and I'd go through the whole Bible and highlight anything that had to do with that particular issue. And then I'd pull them out, I'd put them on stickies, and I'd say, okay, that looks like that, and that looks like that, and that doesn't look like anything. And my belief was that after I did that, I'd be able to sit back and say, I think I know what the answer to this is. So I decided I was going to do a study on the heart from the scripture and that quickly led to a study on the heart and the mind to understand these two things. Because I figure if I can at least understand what God is saying about the heart, I'll have something to say in response. Because the heart is trumping everything. I don't know if you know this or not, right? The heart pretty much trumps it all. Okay, so we're going to do that. Uh... What is the heart? What is the mind? Which, which is the thinker? Thank you, the mind. 
Come on, you know, you, students exasperate you when you do that, when they do that to you. Okay, uh, the mind. Which is the feeler? The heart. Okay, so you have the thinker, you have the feeler, and of course we always point here, you know, but none of us really believe that's there, right? The thinker and the feeler. Okay, so let's, I'm going to give you a little, just a, a little fraction of this total study here, and, and we're going to jump quickly to chapter 8. Here's a passage, Proverbs 23. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Okay, the heart is the feeler. So what does this mean? I mean, eat and drink, but his, he's not really emotionally for you, right? But what is the word, what are the words in front of this? For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I said, well, this messes everything up. You know, it's the heart that's the feeler. It's the mind who's the thinker. Now I've got this thing that says the heart is thinking. Well, I wasn't just there. In your hearts do not think evil of each other. In Zechariah 7. In Mark 2, Jesus knew in his spirit this is what they were thinking in their hearts. Genesis 6, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. Ecclesiastes 2, I thought of my heart. Come now, I will test you with pleasure. This was the, the prophecy given over the child Jesus. This child is destined to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Why does it say for having such a thought in your mind? That was bugging me. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the mind. No, it's the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The heart even speaks. It speaks in objective phrases. The fool says in his heart. There is no God. Say to Ruler of Tara, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to you, in the pride of your heart you say, I am a God. Well, if the heart thinks and have, has thoughts, then what is the difference between the heart and the mind? Chapter 8. I'm going to jump forward, and we're going to talk about the... Whoops. I lost the red pen. That's okay. You can imagine. Imagine with me. Okay, let's draw the let's draw the heart. I mean the mind. It's kind of an amorphous thing, you know. We really don't understand this. It is, it is this is an amazing thing here. And then let's draw the the heart. I'll use the red pen. I'll use the red pen in your imagination. And this is the heart. And traditionally, we think, okay, this is the thing that thinks. This is the thing that feels. This is the feeler. Except we have a huge problem with what the scripture is saying over and over again. So, let me jump to chapter 8 with you. I'll go to the conclusion, and then we're going to talk uh, about it because I want to do um, a little graphic examination with you, and these are the first uh, three things that we want to, to cover. So here's my conclusion. You can go test this out yourself, okay? I'm submitting to you this is the conclusion, the result of a two-and-a-half-year study on the heart and mind. That I am convinced that the heart and the mind are not separate. But the heart is actually the inner sanctum of the mind. And when you and, and this and the heart is really, it represents the things that you believe are really real. 
The things that you believe are really real. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's look at this for a second. Let's talk about uh, truth claims. There are truth claims, and I'm sure that you would all agree, that there are truth claims that you don't know. Does anybody here think they know everything? Okay. There are truth claims that you don't know, and for, for various reasons and ways, experience and so forth, a truth claim will come into your mind. And now you know it, but you may not believe it. Does that make sense? So let me, uh, let me give you an illustration. What if I were to tell you that I got a text this morning from my wife? And my wife loves me, and I love my wife. My wife loves me so much that she will not perm her hair while I am there. And ladies, if you don't know this, let me let you, let you in on a little secret. When God made male, he gave him certain olfactory senses that means... Your perm stinks. <laughs> now, to you, you think it's fine. But for a man, it stinks. And so my wife is nice. She doesn't perm her hair when I'm there. So what if I were to tell you I got a text from my wife. She permed her hair last night. And she woke up this morning, and her hair was purple. <laughs> now, you didn't know that. Right? That was a truth claim that existed out here, and you didn't know that. But now, you know it. The question is, do you believe it? Because some of you may be thinking, well, wait a second. He said, what if I were to tell you? Now, I'm going to tell you that's not true. I'm using this as an illustration. And I'm going to tell you again because I've done this before and I've had people come up afterwards and say, I am so sorry about your wife's hair. So that, <laughs> but I could give you a test, hopefully because you're all just superior people. I could give you a test and on the test, one question that says, I said to you, what if I were to tell you my wife sent me a text, she permed her hair last night and her hair was A, green, B, orange, C, gone, D, purple, and you would say, purple, but you don't believe it, but you know it now, right? Okay, so it's in your mind, but it is not in your heart because you know, except for the four or five will come up and ask if they can somehow recommend something for my wife's hair. So... There is a point at which certain truth claims, because we have a lot of truth claims in our mind that we know, but we don't believe are really real. But here's what's important about the truth claims that penetrate our heart. Because when you begin to believe something is really real, what you believe is really real will produce how you feel. Your emotions, your actions, and even your further thoughts. Let's look at a couple of... The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. The things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. Out of the heart come evil thoughts. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the mouth, heart, the mouth speaks. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. I don't think God is saying these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their 
feelings aren't with me. I think what God is saying is that they're saying things they don't believe. Lord who, may do, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from his heart. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, you could read that and say, you know, Lord, man looks at the outer appearance, but the Lord knows how you feel. And, and that would be uh, typical in a nurture and comfort world. You alone know the hearts of, of men. You probe my heart. Lord, probe my heart and know how I feel. I don't think that's what the psalmist is crying. When he says probe the heart, I think the psalmist is crying, Father, probe. Probe this. See, the emotions that you and I suffer from, we've already talked about this already, right? If you believe that your script will bring you happiness and peace and joy and contentment and significance and pleasure and all those kinds of things, and somebody steps on it, you're going to be angry. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to complain. See, if your heart is simply this black box or red box, that your emotions come out of, how are you going to change that? How, how do you change that? How does the world say? If you're feeling blue, what do you do? Talk to me. What do you do? What does our culture do if you're feeling down? If Somebody. What? Party. party, 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 yeah, party. Have something to drink. Take a shot of this. Do, do, uh, do extreme sport. Isn't that what Jesus told us to do? Remember on the mountain? Remember when Jesus was talking about an emotion? Worry. Do you remember that emotion, worry? And what did Jesus say about worry? What do you say for us? Don't do it, right? And what did Jesus, did he say, look, don't worry. You guys need to stop worrying. Go get on your bike and just ride around the Sea of Galilee. That'll take care of it. He didn't say that. He didn't say, you know, get a little cup of fine wine. That'll take care of that worry stuff. He didn't say that either. What did he point to? The birds of the air, consider the birds of the air, that they neither <coughs> sow nor reap. I get them mixed up too. And what else? The birds of the air and the lily, consider the lilies of the field, that they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so, God so raise the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown in the furrows, will he not do much more for you, O you of little faith? What is God, what is Jesus pointing to? I'm sorry to get so, I'm just, you scare you? <laughs> what is Jesus doing? What's the solution to worry? What is he saying? Faith. Well, faith, but... He's pointing them to the truth of who God is. In other words, they worry. When you worry, I guarantee you, when I worry, I go through this process. I go through the process, Lord, show me what is in my heart that's causing me to worry. Lord, what is in my heart that's causing me to be so discouraged? What is in my heart that's causing me to be dis disappointed? And the Lord shows me that I have believed that which is not true. This is a daily process. Uh, 
when we were in South Africa, we were doing a Truth Project training conference, <clears throat> and we had the privilege to go to a, um, a game reserve, and there was a, a young gal who drove us on the safari wagon. She was going to take us on the safari, you know, truck, and she was going to take us around the game reserve, and she was taking us to our tent for that evening, and she said, now, when I get you to your tent, you stay in the tent. You do not come out until I come get you. And the reason is because there are animals in this game reserve that can rip you apart with one little swat. And I'm serious. They will end your life. They can run you down. They're wild. They're hungry. And they can smell and see. And you're dead meat. And you know what I'm thinking? Lady, come on. I was raised in Idaho. I rode horses. I went into the wilderness areas of Idaho. I've hunted elk. I've hunted deer. I've hunted bear. And we got in the tent, and all of a sudden it got really dark, and then all in the jungle, and all of a sudden you're all the world. And I think, you know, I think I'll stay in the tent. <laughs> and let's suppose we're out on our little safari thing, and I'm sitting on the back of the safari truck taking pictures, which is exactly what I d did and want to do, and it's really dark, and we're really late, and she's headed back, and all of a sudden goes over a bump, and, poof, and off I go, and they don't know it. This didn't happen, I'm just saying. <laughs> Got to be careful, you know, that truth goes. <laughs> and off they go. And all of a sudden, have you ever been in, in the jungle at night and dark? It's a scary place, I'm telling you, it's scary. And all of a sudden, now you're alone and you begin to hear things. And then you see the grass rustling over there and it's, you are going to run like the wind. You're, you're going to freeze. I don't know how you, but <coughs> you're going to act on what you believe is really real. That may be just the wind in the bulrushes, but you will act on what you believe is really real. We act on what we believe is really real. Our emotions come from that. Teach me away, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. What is the psalmist crying here? Give me an undivided heart of feelings? I don't think so. I think this is what he's talking about. What would be an undivided heart in what, in what we're supposing here? What do you think an undivided heart would, would be? Well, if... if the heart, if, as it exists right there, the inner sanctum of the mind, what would, it, what would you think an undivided heart would be? One that has both truth and lies in it. I think that's exactly right, and I think that's exactly what the psalmist is crying here. Give me an undivided heart. Give me a heart in which there are no more lies. Give me a heart in which there is nothing but the truth of God. Remember the phrase that says about hiding the truth in your heart that you might not act against God? Okay, the divided heart. I want to, I want to show you the heart of a child, okay? I'll take my red pen, my red pen now, and I want to show you the heart of a child. Are you ready? This is the heart of a child. Right there. Is that not true? You know, a child, you tell a child something, if it goes in their mind, it's in their heart. They believe it's really real. You tell a child there's a pink pony in the backyard, guess what they're going to do? They're going to run out and look for the pink pony. They're going to look behind the tree. They're going to look under a leaf. Why? Because mama told me there was a pink pony in the backyard. There is no difference between what they know and what they believe is really real, and they will act on it because we act on what's in our heart. 
but something begins to happen. Over time, they begin to realize that people tell them things that aren't true. And they begin to realize that there are a lot of truth claims that can't be believed. And this is partly good. But in a culture and a world in which you and I are bombarded, and my students bombarded by thousands and thousands of, of lies, eventually the heart shrinks until there's nothing left to believe except the truth claim that my happiness and significance and peace and contentment will come if I can just get my script fulfilled because everybody around me is a salesman. And we have the death of belief and the rise of skepticism. And in a world like that, the didactic alone is no longer sufficient. You know what I mean by that, didactic? All you got to do is just tell the truth, man. You know, give them the truth. By golly, that ought to do it. That might have worked 150 years ago. It doesn't work anymore. Because your didactic truth claim is just one of a gazillion that they're getting from everywhere. So we need to be wise. We need to learn how to go from here to here. I'm going to tell you a, a quick story. Several years ago, I took my son, my youngest son, to a father-son camp for a little bonding time. And in the father-son camp, one of the events was to, they gathered, oh, I think there were maybe six uh, father-son couples, and we went up to the top of this little hill, and at the top of the hill was a guy by the name of John. And John was there with his shotgun. And, uh, and, the, um, and the thing that... Skeet. What's the thing that throws skeet? Cool. Pardon me? A skeet thrower. Well, that's the scientific name. So he had the skeet thrower and the skeet and the shotguns, and, and we were going to have a contest. Father-son against father-son, father-son, right? Each get 10. You know, I got 10, my son got 10. And uh, but next to John was a stump, and on the stump was a watermelon. And painted on the watermelon was a smiley face. And that was Hal. And John was talking to us about how he and Hal have been teaching fathers and sons to shoot skeet. And he said, the reason Hal is smiling because he knows some of you guys have never even held a shotgun aren't even going to come close to that. But we're going to do everything we can to get you close, maybe even get you to hit a skeet. And, and Hal and I have been doing this for a long time, and Hal and I want to teach you how to do that. Well, then he got, he got to the, the safety part of the briefing. And uh, he said, now, men, you need to realize this is a weapon. You need, to be, you need to be serious about this. You need to be careful. Listen to all these things I'm telling you about how to do this safely. Because, man, this is a weapon and it can hurt. And Hal and I want you to know how to do this. And he's going through the safety briefing. Well, I'm, I'm standing next to two sons. Not my son, but on the other side. And I, excuse me, I don't mean to be offensive. Pants are hanging down here and they're kind of... <laughs> while he's giving the safety briefing. And I'm a little miffed because I know pretty soon the uh, guy's going to hold a shotgun 10 feet away from me. And I kind of like to know him to know how to be safe with a shotgun. <laughs> and so John is kind of figuring this out as well. Because he's saying, men, you need to listen up. This is the safety. You need to point it down range, da 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 and uh, you've got to be safe with this. And Hal and I want you to know that you need to be safe with this. And we're going to teach you how to be safe with this. Ain't that right, Hal? And oh, Hal went everywhere. <laughs> and there's kind of like a little red Hal, even running down their faces. And these, these, these two kids are next to me. All of a sudden, their eyes are like this. <laughs> and I was so happy because when it came their time, those boys walked up like this. They're holding a shotgun like that. 
I was so happy that John knew how to go from here to here. Because you see, the reality of truth and what is really real, that's what the heart believes, that the truth is really real. And the best way to do that is to show people that the truth is really real. Does this make sense? It's a whole lot easier to simply tell truth than it is to be concerned. See, it's a whole, it's one game to just deliver truth, right? It's another game to have the kind of sacrificial zeal that seeks the shalom of our students and the desire that they not just hear the truth, but they believe it because it is really real. And it means we need to take the time to learn how to come up with the examples. Maybe you need to bundle them up, put them on the bus, and take them down to the local prison to help them see the reality of the truth. I can guarantee you, I speak with a lot of college students, a lot of college students have got 100% on your Bible tests. And I don't mean to point a finger. I'm, I'm pointing one at myself. If you as a parent think all you've got to do is to get a good grade on the Bible quiz, I'm telling you, the university is going to rip them to shreds. Do you know this is not a book? Do you know this is not just a book of didactic truth? Don't get me wrong. This, this is true. This is the Word of God. Do you know how much time God has spent in telling us the truth of God bound up in the story? See, Jesus could have said to the disciples, He could have said this. He said, Okay, men, gather around. Bring your pens and papers and sit right here or your papyrus and your quills. Are you ready? Here we go. Write this down. I am powerful. Got that? That'll be enough for the day. See you tomorrow. He could have done that. Or he could have said, guys, come on. Let's go get in a boat. And they got in a boat. And Jesus fell asleep. And all of a sudden, the wind and the rain and the storm, seasoned fishermen who are scared to death. And the wind is blowing, and the waves is crashing, and Jesus stands up, and they're scared, oh, we're going to die, we're going to die. And Jesus stands up in the middle, and he says, peace be still. And their eyes go. They didn't have to write it down. They knew it, and they believed it. Because they saw it was really real. Well, we have just a few minutes left, so if you don't mind. And by the way, this is, don't lose sight of the fact that this is the work of the Spirit of God, who is called the Spirit of Truth, that Jesus said would come and guide us into all truth. There are a lot of applications from this. I'll let you make them. But I would like, if, if in, the, in the few minutes we have left, to, to kind of close with another encounter, an encounter that Moses had. Do you remember when Moses came down from the mountain? There was something strange about Moses. What was it? His face was glowing. Was that because he fell into an aloe vera patch? 
He'd gazed upon the face of God. He'd been in the presence of God. But he put a veil over his face. Why? Why did he put a veil over his face? This is a good question. Most people say because, why? Hold it just a second because I can't hear that far. They were what? Of, of what? Yeah, just, it just they were afraid. Yeah, and that's usually the answer I get. But you know what? Paul writes to us in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians, and he tells us something that is very, very interesting. Here's, here's the, whoop. Here is the, the passage that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who had put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. That's why he put the veil on the face. He didn't want them to see the radiance while it was fading away. But look what Paul then says. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces, unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. What's going on here? Why is our face unveiled? And Moses' face was veiled. The difference is between understanding this is understanding how the Holy Spirit would work in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would come upon a leader for a particular task and then he would go away. How long is the Holy Spirit going to be on y in you? For a short period of time? Is it fading away? No. We with unveiled faces because the Lord left and he empowered us with the fullness of the Spirit of God that you don't have to veil your face because it's not fading away. We're not like Moses. Think about this. Moses, Moses had a staff. We have the sword. Moses had a temporary visitation of the Holy Spirit. You and I have the permanent presence of God himself. <coughs> and so do your students who are of the Lord. And the Lord has given you the privilege and the responsibility to be an agent of life, to do everything you can, to not take the easy way out and just fall into the giving of instruction, but to go before the Lord praying for your students, praying for wisdom as to how you can be an agent of life that brings the truth of life for the shalom of your students, that they in turn will be agents of life to bring life to others. This is the nature and character of God. And you and I have the privilege to be in the position Don't, we don't get caught up in an Old Testament view of leadership 
An Old Testament view of leadership would lead us to think, oh, you know, if we could just get a leader to come and lead us, you know? You know, by God, if we just get somebody. That's all my happy words. Yeah. <laughs> you have the Spirit of God. It's time to go to Egypt in your classroom and for your students to recognize and understand what God desires, that he desires for their shalom and for the shalom of the world around us. Oh, dear Father, oh, God, would you pierce our heart with the truth of who you are? Would you bury it in our heart so deeply that the wind of the world would not move it out as it does so often. Father, we would renew ourselves with what is right and what is true. Give us wisdom in how we teach in a world that has been so taken with the rejection of you, the rejection of your truth, and suffers so deeply because of that. Lord, would you bless these dear people who sit in a tough seat, who stand in a tough classroom. And yet, Father, they love their students. Would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you make your face to shine upon them? Would you lift up your countenance upon them and give them your shalom? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.